Okay, friends. I have, I have a good, 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 good biography tonight. Okay, here's the deal. This is about Alice Roosevelt, who was Theodore Roosevelt's daughter. This one's called What to Do About Alice by Barbara Curley, illustrated by Edwin Fotheringham. And for you super special grown-ups, if you're looking for a really great book, it's called Hissing Cousins, and it's about Alice Roosevelt and her cousin, Eleanor Roosevelt, who became the wife of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, it's just a great book. I'll put a link to it, too. But what to do about Alice? This is the story of Alice, who was quite the interesting lady. Very cool. Very cool. Theodore Roosevelt had a small problem. It wasn't herding thousands of cattle across the Dakota Badlands. He'd done that. And it wasn't leading the Rough Riders as they charged up Kettle Hill. He'd done that. He bagged a grizzly bear. He captured outlaws. He governed the state of New York and served as vice president of the United States. And still he had a problem. Her name was Alice. Alice Lee Roosevelt. She was hungry to go places, meet people, do things. Father said, he called it running riot, but Alice called it eating up the world. From the time she was a little girl, Alice ate up the world. Her mother died in 1884, two days after Alice was born. Father was sad and everyone was sad for Alice, but she didn't remember her mother and she didn't want to grow up hearing them say, poor little Alice. She wanted to see how high the spring sprang on her grandparents' favorite sofa. Father remarried and had more children, but every morning Alice still cried, Now pig! until father gave her a piggyback ride downstairs to breakfast. The family moved between Washington and New York following her father's jobs. Wherever they went, Alice ate up the world. She rode across Oyster Bay for picnics on the beach. She gambled through the parks of Washington, pretending to be a fiery horse. She learned to love crusty French rolls and English tea served piping hot. She read voraciously and drank in her father's tales of Davy Crockett, George Armstrong Custer, and Daniel Boone. Instead of going to school, Alice was taught at home with lots of time for exploring. In New York City, she watched the students of Miss Spence's boarding school walk oh so primly down the sidewalk. That didn't look like much fun to Alice. She wanted to own a pet monkey and wear pants. As Alice got older, doctors noticed that her legs weren't growing properly. For the next several years, she'd have to wear braces. Sometimes when she walked or ran, the braces would lock up pitching Alice face first to the ground. She did not want anyone saying the poor little thing about that either. When Alice's leg braces finally came off, father encouraged her to ride a bicycle. He hoped it would help her feel less cautious. Uh, I don't think feeling too cautious was Alice's problem, do you? I don't think so. Alice loved her new freedom. She roamed the streets of Washington from the Capitol steps to the gypsy camps by the racetrack. She joined an all boys club. The boys arrived in disguise until father noticed the ruse. He grumbled, Alice was unruly and inconsiderate. She was turning into a tomboy. Enough was enough. It was time for Alice to attend Miss Spence's boarding school and learn to be a proper young lady. Alice was appalled. The idea completely shriveled her. Every afternoon, all summer long, she made a point of going to her room to weep. Father couldn't bear to see Alice so unhappy. When school started in the fall, Alice stayed home after all. She came up with her own solution for her education. She said to her father, let me loose in your library. And she taught herself astronomy, geology, even Greek grammar. She read Twain, Dickens, Darwin, and the Bible cover to cover. 
Every morning, she told father what she had learned the day before. She also grew ever more curious about politics as father's career soared higher and higher. The discussion around the breakfast table, the stream of people seeking father's advice, and the excitement of election night. In 1901, when Alice was 17, father became president of the United States. The whole family moved into the White House. Alice tried to be helpful. She watched her younger brothers and sister so her stepmother could get some rest. Hang on. You can see like they're doing some wacky things down the White House steps. With her pet snake, Emily Spinach, which Alice had named for its color and its resemblance to a very thin ant, she welcomed father's visitors. He spurted to a friend, I can be president of the United States or I can control Alice. I can't possibly do both. As daughter of the president, Alice assumed her role as goodwill ambassador. She helped open the Buffalo Exposition, riding a camel and watching the hoochie coochie dancers. She christened the Kaiser's yacht with great fanfare and a large bottle of champagne. She visited plantations in Cuba and schools in Puerto Rico, all on her best official behavior. Father delightedly wrote to her, you were of real service down there because you made those people feel that you liked them and took an interest in them and your presence was accepted as a great compliment. He warned Alice time and again, however, not to let newspaper reporters catch her gallivanting around. He reminded her that nice people did not want their names seen in the paper. Beware of publicity, father said. Do not talk to reporters. Well, Alice, and you could see Miss Roosevelt, Miss Roosevelt, Miss Roosevelt, Miss Roosevelt, Miss Roosevelt, Miss Roosevelt, Roosevelt, all on the newspaper headlines. Everyone loved Alice. A songwriter wrote, Alice, where art thou? And bands everywhere played it. Mothers named their baby girls Alice. Alice even had a color named after her, Alice Blue, that matched the blue-gray eyes. The press called her Princess Alice. Other young ladies rode in carriages. Alice drove her runabout fast. She two-stepped till the wee hours of the morning. She was even caught betting on a horse race. Letters poured in to father from conservative women's groups. Alice's behavior is outrageous, they said. In 1905, father began his second term as president. As he was being sworn in, Alice waved madly to her friends until her father told her to sit down. You're making a show of yourself, he grumbled. Well, you do it, Alice protested. Why shouldn't I? But this is my inauguration, father replied. He got right back to work, brokering a peace treaty between Russia and Japan. Meanwhile, Alice asked if she might join the American delegation heading to Asia. The papers trumpeted the news. Extra, Alice in Wonderland, how first maiden of land will travel to Orient. Alice boarded the ship in San Francisco with two large hat boxes four trunks and oodles of boxes and bags. Alice had a marvelous time. She danced the hula in Hawaii. She jumped fully clothed into the ship's swimming pool. She watched sumo wrestling in Japan, reviewed the troops in Philippines, toured the gardens of the Empress of China, receiving so many gifts along the way. After four months, Alice returned with two large hat boxes, four trunks, oodles of boxes and bags, and 23 cases of loot. Father was not amused. Alice also brought home a fiance, Nicholas Longworth, a debonair congressman who had been on the trip. And what did she want for wedding presents? Trinkets, said Alice, preferably diamond trinkets. From all over the world, friends, dignitaries, and total strangers sent her gifts. Jewelry, fur coats, silver vases, cakes, clocks, furniture, sewing machines, washing machines, popcorn, bales of hay, a load of coal, a box of snakes, a pair of turtle doves, and a Boston Terrier with its own wardrobe of dog clothes. She even got a pet monkey. She'll accept anything, friends said, except a red hot stove. 
The White House wedding was the social event of the season. 800 guests watch Father walk Alice down the aisle. Alice jumped into her new role as wife of a congressman, hurrying from home, hurrying home from Congress for quick meals of scrambled eggs before rushing back to hear the debates. But she was still the daughter of the president. As her love and knowledge of politics grew, she quickly became one of father's most trusted advisors and ardent champions. And she still ate up the world, dancing the turkey trot at diplomatic balls and playing poker with the boys. She even created the Night Riders, who galloped to the houses of friends and bellowed until invited in for snacks. And father, even after he left the presidency, he remained one of the country's most popular politicians, leading Americans in times of hardship and prosperity. But there was one problem that Theodore Roosevelt never quite solved. What to do about Alice? And you really will love uh, learning more about Alice Roosevelt. She uh, was one of the first people to champion civil rights, uh, certainly women's rights. She was just a really neat, bizarre, bizarre person, but that's cool. My friends, you're very neat people, and if you want to be bizarre, then you can be bizarre too. I, I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Kiss your beautiful brains, kiss your loving hearts, and look in the mirror and say, hey, good looking because you're all good looking, just like Alice Roosevelt was. See ya.